Hello, good evening. I'm Jonathan Rison, Director of the Social Brain Centre here at the RSA, and I'm very glad to extend the soulful welcome this evening. Um, we have a wonderful guest to speak in a moment. I'll introduce Ian shortly. But I just wanted to take a moment to, first of all, some housekeeping. Uh, your phones, please, on silent. Um, but you're welcome to tweet, indeed encouraged to do so. And the hashtag is hash RSA spirituality. Um, so do, uh, do be active there if you feel like it. Um, we are recording this event, so um, keep that in mind. When you ask a question later, um, introduce yourself briefly for posterity. And um, we also have a, lo a, a big live audience, I believe. Um, I was particularly intrigued to hear there's people watching from a, a live streaming event in Guernsey. And Ian's a long-time resident of the Isle of Skye, so we have a big small island community kind of theme going on tonight. Um, now, um, I, this event takes place in the context of a broader project, as some of you know. Um, it's called Spirituality, Tools of the Mind and the Social Brain. It's a roughly 18-month project. And it's broadly about how rethinking human nature might help us to reconceive spirituality and think, think better of its sort of purpose and value. And we've been doing that through a variety of private events at the RSA as part of our research process that will lead to a final report. Um, but we've also been doing it with public events. Uh, we had a, an opening event broad, broadly exploring, exploring rethinking spirituality, trying to get away from the kind of hijacking of the term by the new age and thinking a bit more deeply about how we might use it. Um, and in the second event, we had Guy Claxton speaking about embodied cognition and the role of you know, the fundamentally embodied nature of a lot of a spiritual experience. And tonight, we have a, a talk exploring the soul. Now, Ian um, is someone I'm very glad to introduce. Um, if you haven't read his book, The Master and His Emissary, you're just letting the best in life pass you by. It's a, a really extraordinary work, um, and it's the product of Sometimes you hear that line, you know, a, a luminous mind at the peak of its powers. It's that kind of thing. It's really a, an amazing work. And Ian has a, the rare sort of um, ability to, to sort of traverse neuroscience and the humanities with sort of equal sort of authority in both. He, he knows his kind of dopamine from his serotonin, but he also knows his kind of his Sartre from his Heidegger or whatever. So it's that kind of breadth of vision that I was keen for him to bring to bear on this important question tonight. Um, so without further ado, Ian McGilchrist. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Jonathan, and, uh, for inviting me here. And thank you all for coming. Um, Jonathan asked me to do this, and I sort of foolishly said yes. And I, I feel a complete fraud, actually, because, um, well, I don't really know anything about the soul, and the only thing that consoles me is that probably very few other people do either, so you'll have to just um, cut me some slack anyway. There was a piece in the papers not very long ago um, by a quite well-known uh, team in America who uh, do neuroimaging, uh, and they're particularly interested in moral values. And they found that by suppressing activity in the right temporary parietal region, they caused a failure to understand the nature of moral judgments. Well, this wasn't a surprise to me. Uh, anyone who knows my book would suggest that that was probably going to happen. Um, they set up a scenario of Grace um, uh, hoping to put sugar in her friend's coffee, but, but actually, by mistake, putting poison in, and she died. In the other scenario, Grace intended to poison her friend, but put sugar in, and the friend lived. Um, in the normal state, we probably think it was worse to intend to poison, but the good old left hemisphere, um, on its own, uh, thought in, in what is basically an autistic way that the outcome was the important measure. Well, that's all very interesting. But uh, then these neuroscientists, I won't mention their names to spare them their blushes here, um, finished up by saying, if something as complex as morality has a mechanical explanation, it'll be hard to argue that people have or need a soul. Well, I hope you can see that there might be a category mistake where um, everything that goes through human experience has its brain correlates. But, of course, it doesn't mean that that's all there is to it. So is the concept of the soul a redundant uh, idea now that science has made us see it as a superstition? Or are we actually turning 
uh, our backs on something very important, simply because we can't satisfy demands for precision and proof. Uh, and in fact, are we making a category mistake? Well, so I'm going to ask today two questions. What use is the soul as an idea? And, and I think I have an answer to that. I think it has a use. And I'm also going to ask, if so, what might the soul be like? And about that, I'm afraid, I am less certain that I'm going to have a go. I expect a lot of us would sympathise with the soldier of Marlborough's before the Battle of Blenheim, who was um, reportedly heard praying, O oh God, if there be a God, save my soul if I have a soul. <laughs> and um, uh, nowadays it's become a kind of embarrassment to talk about the soul, and yet until now it has been central to most cultures. The word has disappeared, and language um, is an aspect of reality. If it's true, as Wittgenstein said, that philosophy is a battle against the bewitchment of our intelligence by language, making something disappear by language could bewitch us into thinking it didn't exist. So let's think in simple terms. Can this word be substituted? Well, it seems to me to place the person in a widest context, a context outside the confines of immediate time and space, and even to involve an idea of destiny. So, for example, Othello's great lines, it is the cause, it is the cause, my soul, let me not name it to you, chase stars, it is the cause. It would be difficult to replace that with, um, it is the cause, it is the cause, my mind, my brain, my emotions, my will, my what? Equally, that famous poem of W.E. Henley's Invictus, I am the captain of my soul. I am the captain of my mind, my brain, my emotions, my what? It seems that the concept has a meaning, which we can't exactly say what it is, but it, as I say, sets the human being in a broad context, not the narrow context of where we're encountering the person. And it seems to have this idea of, of a destiny. Um, and so one gets the idea uh, of Keats's, that the world is a veil of soul-making. What did he mean? He didn't mean that we grow up intellectually. He didn't mean that we got better at being moral citizens. He didn't mean that something happened to our heart exactly, although it could have involved bits of all of those. He meant something bigger and deeper. So is our sense of the spiritual something like our moral sense? Well, it, it, it certainly has something of that, it, but it goes beyond it, doesn't it? There's a rather marvellous moment in a, a play of Iris Murdoch's called Above the Gods. The character says, in a way, Goodness and truth seem to come out of the depths of the soul. And when we really know something, we feel we've always known it. Yet also, it's terribly distant, farther than any star. We're sort of stretched out. It's like beyond the world, not in the clouds or in heaven, but a light that shows the world, this world, as it really is. I'll come back to those words. But they put me in mind, she was a Platonist, of Plato's speaking of philosophy in the seventh letter. He says, for philosophy doesn't admit of exposition like other branches of knowledge, but after much converse about the matter and a life lived together, suddenly a light, as it were, is kindled in one soul by a flame that leaps to it from another and thereafter sustains itself. So thinking and moral reasoning are part of it, but what both those passages seem to suggest to me is there is something deeper, more transcendent, over which we have less power and that comes to us. So is it to do with emotion? That's another possible idea, because after all, we say soulful 
often means with emotion. And I think that might be right. But there's a kind of realm in which we can respond to art, I'm thinking particularly of music, for which the word emotion is wrong. Sean, can we have the music? You, is uh, the Curie, so-called Le Roy, or Le Roy, by the 16th century John Taverner. And it strikes me, and has always struck me, that we don't have words for the way in which that works. It is intellectually pleasing. It is, I suppose, emotionally something. But it is, above all, spiritually, whatever it is. There just seems to me no two ways about it. And then one thinks of phrases, the psalmist says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou so disquieted within me? You could say somebody is unhappy. You could say this is sadness. And in a way that's right, depending on what we mean. But if you think of this as the words of a soldier encountering the realities of the life of combat, or a refugee fleeing from such a world, or just a bereaved soul, as we say. It seems to me that it's more than that. And perhaps also the case of depression and so on is not really a sadness. Is it perhaps a soul sickness? Psychiatrists, after all, the word means soul doctors, and in German, there was the idea that doctors were ministering to die Seele, which is a hard thing to define, but that's the point. We need a word that's hard to define, because if we define it, we'll probably miss the point altogether. Well, let's get a little bit less defined. It could be sort of imagination, something like that. And indeed, again, it often involves imagination, but it surely is other than that and goes beyond it. And there's plenty of imagination which is not in the service of the soul at all. In a book called Logos of the Soul by uh, a um, follower of Jung called Christu, talking about um, Jung's uh, idea of the soul, he comments a person who spent his life in a cell may have enriched and deepened his soul. And this wouldn't mean, moreover, that he spent his time accumulating fantasies or writing learned treatises. It's not intellectual or imaginative in the term of fantasies. But it's probably more imaginative in the word, way that Wordsworth used the idea, become a living soul. There are overlaps now. Well, OK. It's not any of those things precisely, but could it be a something that stands over against our embodied existence? Well, I think there's two things wrong with that. The one is that it's not a thing, and the other is that it's not over against our embodied existence. Like matter, according to Whitehead and Bergson, 
the soul seems to me to be process, more process than a thing. We come back to the phrase, a veil of soul making. Perhaps not all souls are equal. Perhaps we have to grow our souls. Perhaps souls can be so thwarted that they're almost extinguished. And many people who've talked about the soul have used imagery of fire or water, which are things that are more like energy processes. For example, Eckhart's Funkelein, the little spark, the scintilla anime, the soul spark, which comes from, corresponds to, and reaches out again to the divine. A potentiality, in other words, something in the process of happening, a latent function that needs to be nourished to grow and expand. And nowadays it's not popular to say that there is a value to suffering, and I'm certainly not suggesting that suffering is ever anything that anyone should or would want to invite into their life. But it is part of the experience of suffering sometimes that it does deepen one's sense of what it means to be alive. Um, a poet that I like very much, Tom, uh, Henry Vaughan, um, had the concept of well, he had a collection of poems, in fact, called the Silex Sinterlands, which means the, spark, the sparking flint, the flint from which the spark comes. And, of course, it comes when it's struck. It comes from the heart and is the spark that is involved in and nourished by suffering. Then I think of that phrase of Wordsworth after his brother was drowned in the... Abergavenny, I think it was. A deep distress hath humanized my soul. And thinking of water, one would think of the Tao, the, the flow of life, which is not far from a kind of world soul, really, and the flow that is in Heraclitus, where everything is flow at the heart. Of course, in Heraclitus, you get imagery both of flow and of fire. Heraclitus has everything. And I, I remember also a wonderful film, which I, I thought was just too complicated to show you a clip of that tonight. But um, I'm very fond of a number of films by Andrei Tarkovsky. One of them I'm thinking of is Solaris. If you think you've seen Solaris because you saw a, a terrible American film made in the 1990s, <laughs> Um, you haven't. You need to see the Russian film made in, I think, 1974, um, which is, I think, one of the most moving and philosophically fascinating films uh, ever made. And it really shows somebody through the imagination of somebody that loves them and through their being imagined and through their experience of suffering actually growing a soul and coming to life. It's a, it's a science fiction film. It's extremely eerie, and it's extremely beautiful. So there, there's a sort of resonance that brings this soul to life between um, the two characters, Chris and Hari, in, in that story. And I think that's a good image of how we grow a soul, if we do grow a soul, in this resonant area. But we need to have a sort of disposition and perhaps that is the soul. Perhaps the soul is a disposition towards life, a disposition that's both rapt and reflective and makes a living process possible, that opens a space. And here, James Hillman, another um, disciple, if you like, of Jung, says, uh, I think, putting it rather well, the soul is less an object of knowledge than it is a way of knowing the object, a way of knowing knowledge itself. So it's not really a thing, it's a disposition, a manner, an attitude, a way of being, and a process, it seems to me. And it isn't contrary to the body, although when in the past it was conceived one died, this soul was the thing that was left, uh, uh, left over, as it were. And I'm at the college at Oxford, of which I'm lucky enough to be a, a quondam fellow, um, is called All Souls. It's actually its full name is All Souls of the Faithful Departed. In fact, I think it's of the Faithful Departed at Agincourt. Um, 
Uh, but it is a, that is the idea of the soul as what's left of people um, once they've died. And, of course, that is a very rich idea, and I'm not dismissing it. But it does rather lead to the idea that um, it's something separate from the body. Incidentally, those who don't like the college take great pleasure in pointing out that the French for All Souls College is Collège des Morts. Um, <laughs> But um, once again, Wittgenstein put his finger on it when he said the human body is the best picture of the human soul. And uh, the soul is intangible, perhaps, but still embodied. And in every culture, images of breath, force, or motion, um, such as in Greek, pneuma and psuche, uh, ideas of breath, and the same ideas exist in, in Hebrew, um, which is not a language I know, but there are the words, I believe, ruach and nefesh, which are words for soul, which are derived from the idea of breath. And, of course, that is the image of God making man by breathing soul into the, into the, uh, breathing his soul into the, into the clay, into the living clay. And without that, the soul becomes something rather nebulous. Without that embodied nature, it becomes terribly tenuous, and it, it, it reminds me of Hadrian's description of his soul as animula, vagula, blandula, that poor little um, wavering, vague and, and, and sort of smooth little creature that slips away out of your mind. So it's important to remember that the soul is embodied and it's deep also in instincts and intuitions, which is probably one of the ways whereby we contact it. And one shouldn't try to cut those out of the idea of the soul in order to make it noble. Um, there was, in uh, the Nazi era, as you know, uh, great festivals of the burnings of books. And Freud's books were among those that were confined, consigned to the flames. And the, those who threw the books into the fire were enjoined to chant the following words. In defiance of the soul-coroning glorification of instinctual life and in the name of the nobility of the human soul, I commit to the flames the writings of Sigmund Freud. C.S. Peirce, um, uh, an American 19th century philosopher who was also a logician and a mathematician and who I very much admire, wrote in, a, in an article um, which became a lecture and was beautifully entitled Detached Ideas on Vitally Important Topics. <laughs> it is the instincts, the sentiments, that make the substance of the soul. Cognition is only its surface, its locus of contact, with what is external to it. The eyes are, we say, the windows of the soul. We see somebody's soul in their eyes. And in portraiture, too, there is a sense of contact with the soul. And we can't quite get away, can we, from this idea. I don't see why we should, because it's very deep in us, that something comes out of the eyes, not just goes into it. It's present in almost every culture and in every language. What I quite like is the Hasidic um, idea of soul, in which there are two distinct souls. Um, they remind me somewhat of a couple of hemispheres I once described. One is the animal soul, which is all about self-preservation and self-enhancement. And the other is the divine soul, which is driven by the desire to reconnect with its source. And our lives are the story of the interplay of these two souls. They're not side by side, by the way, but they're sort of nested, so that the divine soul is inside the animal soul, which is inside the body. They're ostensibly in conflict, but ultimately complementary, and at the core is the divine soul. So they're not the same as... The soul is not the same as the body, but it's not opposed to it either. And we, we need to go to people like Goethe and Blake to be able to understand that opposites don't have to eliminate one another. In, in particular, I like very much Goethe's idea that we find the infinite not by turning our backs on the finite, but through the finite. We find the general not by turning our backs on the particular, but through the particular, and that these are false dichotomies. In, other, in fact, in, in, in the Hasidic tradition, the nature of sephirah, which is essentially the created world, is the synthesis of everything and its opposite. For if they didn't possess the power of synthesis, there would be no energy in anything. This is rather like the idea in Heraclitus of harmonia, two poles that are held in tension and out of which the richness of 
existence um, occurs. So somehow it's something there that is in the world but not in the world, that is in contact with something other but is also imminent here in the world. And I like that because the idea of creation is to create relationship. I think the divine creation was essentially about relationship. And so the, this otherness needs to be accessible. It, it, the divni divine needs to be both transcendent and imminent at the same time. I come back to that phrase in Iris Murdoch, a light that shows the world, this world, as it really is. It's what, it, 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 the soul is what makes the world authentic. It's what is really in touch uh, with, with um, experience. So... Um, she also says it's terribly distant, farther than any star. We're sort of stretched out. So it has that element of otherness, but it's brought together. Uh, and so it's indefinable, but not remote. And in Taya de Chardin's way of thinking, we might say we are steeped in soul. He has this wonderful expression, by means of all created things, without exception, the divine assails us, penetrates us, and moulds us. We imagine it as distant and inaccessible, whereas, in fact, we live steeped in its burning glares. So how do we contact this thing that is other? Well, we need to make an effort. We need to put ourselves in the disposition to understand it. We're not going to understand it at all if we stand there um, resistant to the idea and waiting for it to, to sort of turn up as something credible to us. And I'm reminded here of a joke which a Jewish friend told me um, about a rabbi who's very poor but very spiritual. And his life would be very much more comfortable if he had some money. And he prays to God, please let me win the lottery. And uh, his prayer never seems to be answered. Please let me win the lottery. Never it's answered. One day he's at prayer. And God says to him, look, Samuel, meet me halfway. Buy a ticket. <laughs> and I, 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 I sort of feel... <laughs> There's a deep spiritual truth in that, that we only get there if we are prepared to buy a ticket. As so often, we can say what it isn't. And Hillman, uh, in, in a work called Suicide and the Soul, says the soul is a deliberately ambiguous concept, resisting all definition in the same manner as do all ultimate symbols, which provide the root metaphors for the systems of human thought. And indeed, mind, matter... Nature, gravity, time, energy, and God all fall into this category. We can't really say what they are at all. So spirituality is often about not knowing, because knowing means you've got it wrong. It can't be defined. It's not a concept. It's a symbol, not wholly of our making. And Rabindranath Tagore talks about the ways in which one can understand. And he says in a rather wonderful image that again goes back to water. The small wisdom is like water in a glass, clear, transparent, pure. The great wisdom is like the water in the sea, dark, mysterious, impenetrable. So as Jung says, there may be a danger of wanting to understand the meaning, and by doing so, overvaluing the content, which is subjected to a sort of intellectual analysis and interpretation, so that the essentially symbolic character can no longer do its work. It's lost. And what goes missing is meaning and value for the subject. So there's a sort of danger in my terms of the left hemisphere having to collapse too quickly into something familiar. What is it precisely? Leaving therefore no place for the intuited and the implicit through which all great ideas in art, in religion and in our lives are communicated. Making things more explicit doesn't actually make them easier to understand. It means we understand something other than what it is that we're seeking to know. And in ritual, we see embodied metaphor. Sometimes things can speak very loud to us through rituals, through a mythos, which is not a fiction, but is just another kind of truth from logos that one arrives at by sequential reasoning. Metaphor is a way to deal with the apophatic. They say, he who knows doesn't tell, and he who tells doesn't know. So how are we to approach this? I'd like to just make some attempt before I close. One is to take the idea of depth, which I've mentioned once or twice. Again, 
hard to, hard to define. But I don't feel too bad about this, because here is Berlin, Isaiah Berlin, on depth. The notion of depth is something with which philosophers seldom deal. Nevertheless, it is one of the most important categories we use. Although I attempt to describe what profundity consists in, as soon as I speak, it becomes quite clear that no matter how long I speak, new chasms open. No matter what I say, I always have to leave three dots at the end. I'm forced to use language, which is in principle, not only today, but forever inadequate for its purpose. You have no formula that will, by deduction, lead you to all the vistas opened by profound sayings. In this way, it is something like the sublime, except instead of the sublime without, it is the sublime within. And these two things surely correspond to one another, which is why we feel our soul, as we say, expands in a sublime landscape. The vastness of the view speaks to us internally. And sometimes we encounter this also in more mundane aspects, if you like, of life, or at least more familiar aspects of life, such as our life of love and through those that we love. In fact, in a secular age, one of the ways in which we can really understand that there is something beyond that we call the soul may be through eros at its finest, at its greatest. Jung again interpreted by Hillman, says that this is what makes meaning possible and deepens events into experience, deepens them into experiences, no longer just events but experiences, and which is communicated in love. And there's a very nice piece of um, uh, neuropsychological research recently um, by Fredrickson and Cole um, which suggested um, that people, well, it's molecular genetic research, actually, people who are happy, or call themselves happy, but have little to no sense of meaning in their lives, have the same gene expression patterns as people who are enduring chronic adversity. In other words, they are stressed, although they report happiness. And it's people who have connections betweennesses in their life that give it meaning that report being satisfied. So it's, it's something deep, but it's also something very hard to bring into focus. It's that which grounds, but is itself unseen, like the eye. The eye sees, but we don't see the eye. It is the ground of our seeing. And attention, again, which makes the world what it is, is an aspect of consciousness, not a function of it. The spiritual is often in the places where we're not looking directly, but in the background, the in-between. Bonhoeffer calls it a kind of cantus firmus, using an idea from polyphonic music, the melody, as it were, to which all the other melodies provide the counterpoint. And he makes the point that if that element in our life, the spiritual, is kept going as the cantus firmus, we can depart as far as we like away from that into the world, the actual world, the concrete world, the material, the fleshly, the emotional, the everyday, without losing something. So, finally... I'm talking very much about the soul in general, but what about each of our individual souls? How do we square the idea of soul as something sort of generic and something particular? Well, it seems to me that the whole of creation is about the making of things particular out of things that are whole. And so, in, and in the Goethean way, they're not necessarily opposed to one another. They may be aspects of one another. Individualization is part of creation, achieving an unfolding into complexity that is not in the world soul idea. We need both quanta and qualia. We need particles as well as waves. We need individuals as well as flow. And soul is that which seems to me not to be in any way opposed to material existence, but transcends it. It's not separate from the material in a, in a way that a wave is not separate from the water. And yet the form, the force field, the thing that shapes it, the thing in which it's instantiated, is something concrete and not concrete at the same time. And I would see this as an aspect, really, if you ask me my personal opinion, and that's all I can give because none of us has a privileged experience of this, I would say there's something 
in the idea of panentheism, the idea that there is multiplicity and unity without denying either and without delimiting the concept of the divine in the way that pantheism does. So to wrap up, a phrase of the American philosopher Eugene Gendlin, which I love. We think more than we can say. We feel more than we can think. We live more than we can feel. And there's much else besides. And perhaps the soul is what we mean when we reflect on that much else besides. Thank you, Ian. Um, I'm going to ask Ian a couple of questions and then open up to everyone else. Um, I want to speak to you about your deliberate ambiguity. Um, because my experience of running this project is that clearly there's the soul, there's God, there's spirituality, there's all sorts of terms that are contested. But people have varying degrees of comfort with that idea that you can have something that's essentially contested or you know, inherently ambiguous. And I want to ask you, what would you say to some sort of Paxman-like question that says, that's all very well, Ian, a wonderful half hour, but what is the soul? <laughs> well, I mean, in a way, I've attempted to address that um, as appropriately I ca- as I can. One should always, it seems to me, be as precise as the subject matter permits one to be, but no more precise than that. And um, because otherwise there is a bogus precision. We're always being asked to be precise about many things that are inherently not precise. And we'd rather have us quantify it in some way and give a precise answer which is actually more of a lie than saying it can't be made precise. So your answer is basically to the questioner, you're asking the wrong question, you're asking more than I can give, uh, uh, you misunderstood the subject matter. Yes, uh, in any question, uh, it's a matter of two minds meeting and you have to have the right disposition for the subject matter you're approaching. Right. So th- which, is, which is part of what the soul is, you're saying. That this, it's almost as if... If a soul is to some extent dispositional, one's yes. view of knowledge, one's view of what knowledge is for, uh, what experience is, what it means, then that may be a sort of prerequisite for really understanding what the soul is. Well, I, I'm only speaking, of course, inevitably from, from experience, but it seems to me that if the soul accords with anything, it accords with an attitude, a disposition, a certain kind of attention to the world. And it can be very much evoked by certain experiences with, with music, for example, for me, with the natural world, with, with um, love and, and friendship, and with, with things that uh, I feel resonate with, with, with what that is. And what I tried to say was that none of the terms that we might be you know, um, liable to, to, to uh, substitute for it really um, uh, the job, yeah. does the job. Okay, interesting. And um, I think I, I know from prior experiences of these events afterwards try to think of what were the questions that weren't asked and <laughs> I think some people um, understand that with hugely complex issues covering you know, the, the whole of the world and the meaning and the purpose that's inherent in those really large questions some ambiguity is entirely appropriate um, but nonetheless there will be people thinking well where is Ian exactly coming from, what exactly is his position um, you know, is there a theistic perspective here? If it's, is, it, is it panentheistic? Is that where you end up? Um, if so, you know, people will want to sort of locate you as a messenger to make sense of the message. Can you, can you help with that at all? Well, well, I might say I can't help with that, really. Um, it, in a way, it's, the, it's uh, in, in terms of the uh, hemisphere hypothesis, it's the, the need that the left hemisphere has to make things certain and make sure we know what category we're talking about. Um, but uh, as you know, um, what I believe is uh, at least as important is the way in which things are done and the manner and that things are essentially unique. So I fall back in a way on the wisdom that he who knows doesn't say. Um, unfortunately, I've already said far too much. <laughs> Great. Thank you for that. Okay, um, I'm going to open up for questions. And um, um, raise your, do, do you err on the side of asking earlier rather than later? Because we tend to have a flurry at the last minute that we can't deal with. So if I can see your hands early, that's good to know. We have two at the front here, two there. Okay, we'll take the Twitter sphere just so they know that we're, we're with them. Matthew, first of all, please. Uh, right, I'm trying to 
We've got Nicole Shadbolt who asks, is spirituality a feeling or a belief? Uh, E.g., is it like religion where you either believe it or not, or do you just feel it? Uh, we have a question from Middle Way who asks, did the New Age hijack spirituality or was it left luggage waiting to be picked up? Uh, Danny asks, does the soul provide symbolic framework to ensnare us as well as hope for freedom? And someone else asked, what is the soul? But you've asked that. Right. Great. Um, let me take um, not all of them because that will weary us, but the, the question about... Um, the, the new age sort of hijacking mm. hijack spirituality, because so that's quite important. When we say we're working on spirituality, a lot of people assume that's what we mean, mm. and clearly we don't. Mm. So how do you feel about avoiding that hijacking? What, what's the sort of alternative? Well, you know, when something that can't actually be um, uh, airbrushed out of existence, um, however much um, our, uh, dogma says it should be, um, disappears, it we will re-emerge somewhere. And it re-emerged in a, in, a, in a sort of arena where people were simply less dogmatic. And I think that's what happened. Uh, and I'm not really saying there's anything wrong with any particular um, kind of, of um, way of approaching the realm of the, the, the spiritual. I think those who don't know are probably you know, in a better place than those who think they do. Um, and I think that... Um, that, yeah, um, although we want to avoid the suggestions of, um, I don't know, something self-indulgent that goes along with the idea of, of, of hippiedom, um, I'm not averse to the idea that, yes, I mean, in certain cultures, when it disappears, it will emerge in subcultures. Okay. And you're not averse to hippiedom either, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I quite like the question about is it a belief. I, I, I mean, I really want to stress how, how little help cognition is in these areas. And, um, you know, uh, Christianity is a, is a religion that's um, overwhelmed by propositions of a cognitive nature. Um, and, uh, you know, having to sign up to certain beliefs um, uh, is one of the ways in which Christianity is often mi misconceived, I think, actually, but nonetheless is unfortunately conceived. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say um, the mystical tradition in which um, experience is more important than cognition uh, is valuable here. Great. Uh, Mark. Thank you very much. And I was wondering, as you were talking, whether the soul gives offence, and that's partly what's happened to it. And perhaps it's easy to say it might give offence if you're an out-and-out -out materialist and can't understand it, but maybe it gives offence to us. You touched on suffering, for example. Um, maybe it rightly gives offence to us. It does challenge some of our most profoundly, deeply held notions um, in the modern world. Um, maybe I was thinking of other tensions like the individual against the collective, perhaps. Um, but, uh, or control, giving up. They seem, when you were talking, I was wondering about giving up some kind of control that's required to put yourself in this dis disposition to see the soul. Yes. Well, I, I, thank you, Mark. I mean, I think there is a problem um, in our world with, with not being in control and um, with making oneself vulnerable. I mean, in essence, uh, to talk about the soul at all is to make oneself vulnerable. Um, there'll be people who will no doubt think um, uh, the less of me for, for agreeing to talk about it. Um, so I think we all um, do that, but I don't think anything useful in this world ever came about by trying to be invulnerable. And probably most prizes are won by putting oneself in the way of something that may or may not deliver. It's again the desire to have certainty and control, which actually gets in the way of understanding, I would say. Thank you. And we have two questions here at the front. So yeah, take them one after the other, thanks. Um, thank you very much, Mr. McGilchrist. I've read your book. It's profound, and I really do appreciate how much it has added to my thinking. I come as an international educator, but my question comes particularly as an American public school teacher. You talk about the soul, and you even reiterated that it can be, I forgot the word you used, but developed or helped by music, by nature, by love, which I agree. It's also apparent to me that it can also be harmed and in specific when you talked about autism the increasing autism I see in our school system and I'm speaking again from mine American school system is to me almost a damage process of the soul and I wonder what you thought about that 
Golly, um, a, a very good question. Um, first of all, I do think that it follows that if it can be grown, it can be stunted. And uh, so in that way, I think all souls are not equal, which is, which is not a, 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 an idea that many people uh, would feel comfortable putting, putting about. But we do talk about people as being magnanimous or pusillanimous, which basically means being large-minded or small-minded. Um, or small-souled, really, because it's anima. Um, but, uh, of course, I would be extraordinarily um, uh, averse to, to the idea that uh, somebody who was autistic um, somehow sacrificed the possibility of a soul. Um, I think that would be entirely wrong. Uh, however, I do think that autism in our culture, and it is getting commoner, um, it's terrifying that... Uh, children now have to be taught how to read the human face as a matter of course, apparently, in schools, which was never the case until very recently, only for children with autism. And if the face, the human face, is one of the things that communicates the soul, it's cutting off one of the ways in which we can understand the soul and live it. Um, so I think there are, there are dangers, yes. I think that you know, the more we liken ourselves to machines and believe ourselves to be machines and make ourselves more like machines the more we drive it out. But I wouldn't want um, here to, to try and conflate um, autism as a human condition with, with that problem. Thank you. There's a question just behind you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I'm Roger Kennedy. I'm a psychoanalyst. And in some ways, I mean, I think the soul, what happened to it, 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 it is certainly within the analytic uh, encounter, I think. I just certainly feel that one is, has the care of one's patient's soul. Um, uh, I certainly, oh, thank you, yeah. <laughs> I certainly think in, in the psycholytic encounter, one has enormous responsibility for the uniqueness of the person. Yeah. And, and that one, the great danger, certainly, is to define too much the human being, even if you're trying to interpret, you're trying to make sense, but to allow something to take place and to listen to, to whatever it is that's happening. That's a different kind of, the soul territory is different from... The, the need to constantly find meaning. Incidentally, I mean, in, last thing, in terms of... Just, just, we need a question quite soon, please. <laughs> well, that's, what do you think of that? Well, um, <laughs> 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 um, no. well I, I, I know uh, and have uh, uh, not read all, but part of a, a, a book you've written about this, which is a very interesting topic. I, I would agree with you that keeping things um, open is part of the process of uh, successful interaction with a, with a patient or, or, or either of, a, of an analyst or of a psychiatrist. And, but it's also part of um, all creative interaction, is keeping the field of potential open. And the trouble with this need for definition and clarity is that it, it, it causes us to collapse things into things that we think we already know, rather than opening us up to discover something new that's going to lead to spiritual death. Okay, we have a flurry of questions, as I thought we might. Um, we're <laughs> going to take um, Elizabeth first, and then we're going to take a few others together. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth Oldfield from Theos. Uh, you've given some very uh, high culture quotes and examples. I'm going to bring us right down to low culture with a Harry Potter reference, okay. uh, which is that one of the most interesting places I've seen the concept of the soul used recently is in those last few books of Harry Potter where you see the bad guy tearing his soul into seven pieces through murder. And it's not a particularly theistic universe, this kind of e echoes, but uh, otherwise um, it's quite an unexpected thing to see there. So I wondered if you think that uh, one of the ways we think about the soul is, is that kind of moral component of human beings um, the, the goodness that needs guarding and can be um, corroded and uh, whether that actually has more legs <laughs> in a secular world um, than perhaps the concept of God. Wow. The goodness that needs guarding. Y yes. I, I, in short, I think yes. I mean, yet another area on which I'm not an expert is Harry Potter, so I can't say about that. <laughs> but I do think that the um, idea um, that uh, there is something at stake is really quite important. And actually, that is essentially what is missing, partly from the concept of the meaning in life. Uh, and I think that, in a gentle way, the idea that a soul is a process that can be thwarted or nourished 
is a useful one. And I think that sometimes, yes, forces can act to inhibit that. Now, whether one uh, uh, gives them a spiritual life as forces or not is, is, is a question that we could debate for a long time. Okay, great. I'm going to take all, lots of questions at once. I'm going to write down the gist of them, and then I'm going to leave them to Ian to sort of answer together. We'll begin with Esther over here, please. I, I ha thank you so much. It's a great talk. Um, a quick question, which is, if we, um, if we have a physical uh, material body that dies, um, what then happens to the soul? Because if we're saying it is something beyond the physical and beyond the material, then what happens at death? Huge question, we'll come to that. And um, yeah, uh, here, whoever's one here in the middle of the middle row, please. Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, oh, uh, you mentioned that, ooh, sorry, you mentioned that um, depression could be seen as like an illness of the soul. So I was just wondering, as a psychiatrist, what your thoughts were um, about using psychiatric medication as a treatment for that? And okay. if. And yes, we've got Fabulous a flurry here, so whoever can way, take the mic here. Yes, there's a gentleman here next to Abby, thanks. Uh, Brian Pierce, and thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Um, I wondered if you might just say a little bit about how you came to see value in the panentheist approach, uh, which seems to me to offer a framework within which people who are religious, in quotes, and people who are not, might be able to share their uh, common human experience and reflect on the kind of issues that you were talking about today. But I'd just be interested what led you to that, to that concept. Okay. I think I'm going to make a judgment that we're going to take those three questions are so rich that They're we're going to so take those rich. three and we'll come back to the others in a minute. First of all, life after death, if you can. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, of course, this is the big question that I, I didn't exactly answer. Um, my, my, own, my own intuition is that there is much more besides, as Gendon says, and that we only know a part of things. I think it's actually only rational to suppose that our brains are not equipped to know everything. So, again, I'm not uh, frightened to say I don't know the answer to this, but you were asking really my view, I think. And my view is this, um, that... We are like, uh, uh, we have to use analogies, we have to use metaphors and images because that was the theme of my talk. This is the only way we can do it. In one way or other, like waves in the water, if this particular wave hadn't existed, another one would, and the water would all have been there. Uh, but uh, while that wave is there, the water and the wave are one in a way, and then the wave passes on. But uh, that gets us so far. But I think that suggests that, as it were, once we're gone, we might as well not have been, except that waves have an impact on the world. They erode stones, they carve landscapes, and they also create things in human minds. So they're not entirely without their consequences. But it seems to me that whatever it is that is the force of creation, it's got a thing about multiplicity. Whatever it is, it loves multiplicity, abundance, superabundance, uh, and diversity, and that therefore the whole point is that there are individuals like you and me, and that that can't be uh, suddenly uh, you know, eroded uh, to the point where it has no meaning. So uh, we can't, with the, with the kind of cognition we have now, answer this with a proper model, because we, um, we ha perhaps haven't got enough dimensions. I'd love to talk about a, a book in 1844 called Flatland, which it tried to imagine what it would be like for somebody who could only use two-dimensional representations of the world to represent the three-dimensional world that they knew, and it would always be distorted, as maps always are in places, and you have to do a trade-off. Well, I think it's like that. We can't actually express it, but the things are this, that we, uh, each soul is connected, I think, to something bigger, to, and to everything, in fact, it's like an outpouching that exists for a while that enriches the whole. And there is that meaning also in my idea of the hemispheres, that everything is first implicit. It then is unpacked and made immensely rich and explicit by a process. And it, it, that whole then takes it up again. Perhaps that is actually like creation. Perhaps that is an image of the, not just mind universe, but of the universe. So that was my answer to that question. It's a good moment to remind you that we do record these events. You can hear that again later. <laughs> um, now, now the, the next one, because yeah. then so another yeah, brilliant question. Sure. 
is de if depression is a soul sickness, what, you know, unpack that, what do I think of depression, what do I think about medications for depression? Well, what I mean is that I think that it involves not just the mind or the heart, but the whole person, including the spiritual dimension. And indeed, when people are depressed, often they experience an extinguishing of the sense of meaning and the extinguishing of their religious sense. So um, uh, this happens to um, monks and contemplatives when they get uh, what, what is called Acadia or uh, Exidy, um, as it was called in the Middle Ages. And... Um, the, uh, there was a wonderful book by M.C. O. Drury, who was a, uh, M. O. C. Drury, who was a, a um, doctor, an Irish doctor who was a disciple of Wittgenstein's, and who actually became a doctor on the recommendation of Wittgenstein. And he wrote a book, which is now, uh, I fortunately have a copy, but it's very difficult to obtain now, called The Danger of Words. But in it, he has a chapter on this topic. And he says, what would have happened to all the great artists in the past if they'd been given antidepressants? You know, we, we might not have war and peace, for example. So there is that worry. But also, I know depression at second hand, and I know it at first hand, and it is so terrifying, true depression, so destructive, so corrosive, that one could not wish anyone to languish in it in a moment longer than they have to, however productive it would make them. And generally, major depression doesn't make you productive. Having had it, if you recover, does, because I think you learn from it. As I said, I think suffering can help the soul to grow. So medications are good, and the fact that a medication can affect the soul really takes me back to my point that whatever it is, it's not out of touch with embodiment. And the third question? And pantheism. And before you say that, can you just define it for us? Because it's not... not okay, there is right. pantheism, which, roughly speaking, is that God is the sum of everything. And then there is panentheism, which means that God is not the sum of everything, but God is in everything. There is a divine element in everything. And I like that. Uh, it corresponds with... It corresponds with experience. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, uh, it, uh, I have read a lot of theological things and mystical works and so forth. I've, I've meditated, I've contemplated, I've lived. I've been a bad boy, I've been a good boy. Uh, I, I, you know, here we are. Uh, you're asking me, how did I get this idea? It, it came from experience. And I think I like the idea that it's a, it's a, um, it's a coming together uh, a place for those who don't have a creed with those who do because in fact um, the place that I found it um, most well expressed was in the works of a man called Philip Sherard who uh, it, it was a, a Greek Orthodox uh, and in his spirituality and in the spirituality that one finds in Greece one sees the, the notion of the sanctity of every single living thing, every blade of grass, every everything, and indeed even in everything that we think of as possibly evil, which takes us into the realm of, uh, well, again, Oriental religions are able to cope with this, but modern Christianity can't cope with this. Okay, great. We have some more questions here. We'll try and take them together. Begin at the back and move forwards if we can. And if there's last chance to put your hand up, uh, after this there won't be another chance. Okay, so thank you. Well, very we have much. to be, keep your questions as brisk as. How as would it. you meet the charge of somebody as sadly bereft of spirituality as myself, that all you've done is reinstated Descartes' ghost in the machine, but instead of a product, it's a process? Great. Okay. Um, hold that question if you can. I know it's tempting to answer it, but we'll take uh, next question, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the uh, talk. And my name's Andy Hopper. Um, if, if we take the soul as something that could be stunted and grown, uh, how do we account for sort of evil souls or, or, or people developing sort of the opposite? They must still have a soul. Okay, thanks. Get some more. Yes, gentleman here on the side. When we rem My name's John Field. I'm a fellow of this society. When we remember someone who has died, whether it's a loved one or someone with whom we've been acquainted, what is it we're remembering? Is it not simply their soul rather than anything physical about them? Okay, thank you. And um, just behind you, please. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, do you think belief in the soul presupposes or necessitates belief in a higher power or a deity? And if not, in this secular age, uh, 
wither the secularists who believe in, in the soul. Okay, great, thank you. And gentlemen here, please. We've heard very little in this talk about the power of science to unlock what and un help us understand what's happening in the brain. The reasons you gave us for taking talk of the soul seriously are that there are various experiences which are hard to explain in other ways, such as the profound reaction we all had to hearing that beautiful 16th century music, or people's reaction through terrible suffering which can make them a more compassionate person. But isn't it quite likely that in the next decade or so, the, the neurotechnology, scanning of the brain, building better multi-level models of the brain is going to give us more precise and useful ways of talking about it and that the talk of the soul is going to disappear much like God of the Gaps disappeared because there is useful ways to talk about it which gives us more precise and useful meanings than the, the older uh, imprecise. Okay, great, thank you. We'll try and answer some of those together now and if we have time we'll take the other questions. Um, first of all, Ian, um, Descartes goes from the machine, but process, not product. Okay. Have you just done that? Yeah. And if you can, tie okay. in the other questions as well. Oh, if you can, if you can, it's all right. I'll, 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 okay. I'll keep you um, So. So, if it's not goes from the machine as product, are you just saying it's goes from the machine as process, or are you going beyond that somehow? Well, it's not ghost in a machine. First of all, the body is not a machine, and I'm not making a hard and fast distinguish, distinction between the body and soul in a way. So I'm saying that in they, 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 the, the body and soul are aspects of perhaps the same thing. And it's important to see that you can have duality without having dualism. Uh, the old image of the Tai Chi Tu, the, the, which we think of as the yin-yang symbol, shows two things that are distinct, but they go together to make a whole and complement one another perfectly, and are really aspects of, of the life force. Um, they even contain a little bit of one another. I can't illustrate this, but if those of you who know the symbol will know what I'm talking about. So I, I think um, what you're really saying is, if you talk about a soul at all, are you, are you sort of guilty of a Cartesian dualism? And I think those are not the only options at all, and I hope to steer clear of that tonight. Um, perhaps I didn't succeed. And, well, in Ian's defence, his, his book does touch on those things at some length as well, so yeah. it's not a reference point. The question about uh, whether you need to believe in a higher power for the soul to have sort of provenance, yeah. you've kind of touched on that already, but is there anything you want to add? Um, well, I think anything that puts one off from the notion that um, one has a spiritual element is, is going to be um, you know, uh, disadvantageous and, and counterproductive. Uh, but I think that... Uh, not to be able to believe in something that is beyond us is, yes, to close the door on, on the idea of the soul. In a way, I suggested that the soul is something that communes with something that is beyond what we, we actually can express in, in language. And if you'd like to call that a higher power, I think it's a useful idea. I've known it'd be very helpful to um, non-believing um, patients who have to deal with addictions and so forth. And maybe it is a way of talking about deep intuitions that come from well below the conscious level, a kind of wisdom which is not just our wisdom, but at any rate is, I mean, as Jung suggested, it might be a wisdom of ages that uh, we're able to tap into. So one way or another, you come back to the idea of something beyond the immediate that we can define. And it really, that's why it's got to be indefinite, because it's beyond the defined area of knowledge. Now that's probably what that gentleman picked up when uh, he was saying, you know, we'll, we'll know more and then we'll get it precise. But I think that's just a category mistake. That if you got it precise, you'd have got it wrong. Um, th there's no, um, you know, th this is the kind of error that is egregiously made by neuroscientists. Um, like, you know, you remember the terrible um, uh, uh, fervour and excitement there was in the papers. Great splash. We've discovered what happens when you fall in love. You know, there's this circuit that lights up in your brain. Well, you know, I mean, for me that was a huge relief because until that point I had no idea what falling in love was. But then at last I knew it was some twittering of ganglia. Well, I mean, this is just, this is nonsense on stilts. And to suggest that somehow we'll be able to find something in the brain that corresponds with the soul is just crass. Okay, to be, to, to, to be fair though, I mean, I think to, to give the questioner his due, the, the question is, 
is there, it may be the case that science cannot tell us what the soul is or that science cannot tell us anything that would rule out the existence of the soul. But is it in any way the case that science can help us understand better what the soul is? No. No, okay, <laughs> fine. Okay, um, I mean, it's, it's about um, appropriate modes of thought for appropriate um, objects of thought, and it comes back to, this was all covered by Aristotle, there are different things, different forms of wisdom, different forms of knowledge, don't confuse the two, or three. Okay, we'll come back to that. Um, Jules, take a question here. Um, so, uh, thank you for the great talk. Yeah. Uh, so there's been a, a millennia-old um, idea that... Oh, sorry. Uh, a millennia-old idea that there was a connection between uh, souls and dreams, so the idea of shamanic trances, or you think of Cicero's dream of Scipio, where someone falls asleep and their soul leaves, uh, all the way up into Freud and Jung. But it seems like psychology and psychiatry has lost that idea that um, dreams have anything uh, useful to tell us. Do you think we've um, closed the door on a useful source of knowledge about ourselves and about the soul? Can I answer all? Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, I, I like the question. Um, I think uh, it, my answer will be that sometimes dreams can be telling us powerful things and sometimes they can be complete rubbish. And the same is true of psychosis. Um, in some, one mustn't glorify psychosis, but sometimes people with mental illnesses have insights into things which otherwise they wouldn't have. But sometimes they just think there is an airplane glued in their left ear and there isn't. <laughs> Uh, uh, equally with taking drugs, sometimes one can have an experience which seems very meaningful and changes your life, and other times um, you just um, see a lot of nonsense. So it's a bit like, you know, one mustn't get dogmatic. I always felt that Freud's idea of the, the lapsus lingui, the, the sort of slip of the tongue, that it always carries meaning. Well, the, you know, the boring answer is sometimes it does, and sometimes it's just a slip of the tongue. Gosh, okay. Um, I think we'll end there, because we've had a lot of great questions and it's funny to think about. Um, just to let you know that there will be um, more talks in the series. So there's another um, two before the final one, so there's three in social to come. Um, but the main thing I want to do now is just to thank Ian for a wonderful talk.